I just took a deep breath of oxygen. And that is the subject of our mini lecture 2, addition of oxygen nucleophiles to CO. So we're right about here. You've covered the basics in the previous mini lecture, so let's get started. Oh, I wanted to give you this little answer sheet though before we get started. I hope you did do the last lecture's random reactions and wondered what the products were. Well, here you go. Now, back to oxygen. Oxygen at nucleophiles plus aldehydes and ketones. Everything's going swimmingly, right? This introduces us to the really interesting world of biochemistry because there's lots of this chemistry going on in us even as we speak. So this is really useful information in terms of those of you with a biochemistry bent. And it, you know, it should all fit in wonderfully, right? We've already seen how hydride, the organometallics, cyanide, they all add one to, to the carbonyl. So it's all the same sort of pattern here. Nucleophile attacks carbonyl, pumps out the pi electrons onto the oxygen. Well, the good news is the oxygen nucleophile does the same thing. The little twist is that once the alcohol adds to the carbonyl to give you the hemiacetal, it can react again to go further and give you an acetal. So the nomenclature of this section is actually a little confusing for some folks, but there's a reason why I've made this H bold. Because the hemiacetal has the H on the oxygen. So you can always tell the hemiacetal because it's got a hydroxy. Hemiacetal. Another way you can remember is you're halfway to product. You've added one molecule of the alcohol. You're halfway there. You add another molecule, you get all the way to the acetyl where there's no hydrogen on the oxygens. Now, having said that, your book doesn't tell you anything about hemiketals and ketals. So I'm going to throw in this nomenclature break for you because if you do take biochemistry or go on into the field of biochemistry, you may run across this nomenclature. It's this simple. If you're talking about an aldehyde reacting with an alcohol, you get the hemi acetal and the acetal. So to highlight some things, aldehydes give acetals. Ketones, on the other hand, give hemi Ketals. K for ketone. And of course, the hemiketal can react further to give you a ketal. And the key thing that will help you keep these separate is that in the ketal, the two groups attached to the carbonyl carbon are both alkyl groups. They're both carbons. Whereas in the aldehyde, you still have that H attached, which means it came from an aldehyde to begin with. So just to point out what may be obvious, 
the oxidation states of these carbons do not change. So this is a plus 2 over here, it's a plus 2 over here, it's a plus 2 over here. So you can always tell where the carbonyl carbon is by looking at the oxidation state. So that is your nomenclature break. I'm not going to hold you responsible for knowing the difference between an acetal and a ketal. I will use acetal to refer to all these, hemiacetal or acetal, but you should know that there are such things as hemiketals and ketals, and you may run across that nomenclature in your organic chemistry and biochemistry travels. All right, so back to the PowerPoint. So this is biochemistry galore. Addition of oxygen nu nucleophiles to carbonyls gives you these species, these tetrahedral species. Now. A very important point about the addition of these oxygen nucleophiles is that it has to take place under acidic conditions. Basically it's not, huh, no pun intended, it's just not going to work unless there's acid around. So I'm going to run through the mechanism here and point out that this guy is acidic. It's a catalyst that we're using to give this reaction a good boost under acidic, catalytic acidic conditions. This is toxic acid, aka toluene sulfonic acid. You will see it abbreviated as TSOH. That's actually somewhat unfortunate because a lot of times people look at TSOH and think it's a base. After all, there's TS and there's OH. New, 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 new. TSOH does not exist as a salt. It refers to this strong crystalline acid. All right, so basically what we've got here is our alcohol reacting with the strong acid to give us a ketone still sitting there. Oh, you know, that's not the right first step, is it? Dang it. I'd better just erase that. What did I say under acid conditions? What's the first thing that happens? Ah, that's right. The first step is protonation of your carbonyl. Now, actually, what I showed you earlier would be fine. The, map, the bottom line is, if the alcohol gets protonated by the toxic acid or your carbonyl gets protonated by the toxic acid, the, the important thing is that you end up with your strengthened electrophile. If it's not being protonated by the toxic acid, it would be protonated by your protonated alcohol. So six one, half dozen the other. Once I have that super electrophile, we know what happens next. My nucleophile comes over here and kicks out those electrons. All steps here are reversible. So I've got my OH, CH3. The hydrogen is still attached to my diol here, and there's a positive charge on it. Proton transfer galore here. Now what we need to do is deprotonate here and protonate here. How am I going to do that? I'm under acidic conditions. How can I possibly deprotonate? You're never at a loss for bases. Remember, you're swimming in a sea of this alcohol. So it's trivial for me to deprotonate there. And you've got acid catalysis. So I'm just going to use a generic H plus over here to keep this a little bit tidier. I protonate to make a good leaving group here and I deprotonate here. And you should be asking yourself, well, why does it happen like that? 
why does the hydroxyl get group get protonated? Why doesn't this base just deprotonate over here? What's you know why is it so specific? Well, the bottom line is it's not specific at all. All of these protonations and deprotonations are happening at once. You've got Avogadro's number times 10 of molecules in your beaker. There's tons of stuff going on in there. So all of these reversible steps are happening at once. And we're using an excess of this alcohol to push the equilibrium all the way to product eventually. Now, at this point you've got a great leaving group. You've got clearly polar conditions. It's entirely reasonable that this would be an SN1-like, well, naturally, an SN1-like mechanism where that leaving group leaves and I'm left with a carbocation here that's particularly stable because of course it can be stabilized by resonance from the adjacent oxygen. In any case, it makes good sense that this guy is out of there, minus H2O, and now this electrophile is looking for a nucleophile. Okay, well what nucleophiles are present? Clearly, there's tons of the dial, but here just sitting a measly one, two, three, four, five atoms away is that same great nucleophile. So the intramolecular reaction is faster and it reacts to give me this intermediate again note that the hydrogen is still attached it doesn't fly off in mid-flight once I have this intermediate anytime you see a protonated oxygen what are you gonna do you're just going to deprotonate it with either your alcohol Ooh, I think I'll go over here or the conjugate base of your catalytic acid. That's a little less likely because it's just present in a very tiny amount. And that gives me this ketal, or as your book would say, acetal. Okay, so notice that here's the carbonyl carbon and two alkyl, alkoxy groups are attached. We were at the, uh, excuse me, can't spell today, hemi acetal stage here. Only one of the alcohol groups has attached here and here is my halfway there hydroxy holding an H group to say that I'm on my way to the acetal. Alright, so I gotta admit this mechanism really drives people crazy. Um, I think if I were you I would practice it a lot until it seems to really make sense to you. I purposely chose to use a dial because that is the more, it seems to give people more problems thinking about how does a, a dye alcohol react with this. If it was two molecules or two equivalents of something like methanol, it's the exact same mechanism, it's just that you wouldn't have this intramolecular attack here, you would have an intermolecular attack from a second molecule of methanol. So, we're going to move on to
to some key points. First of all, it's got to be acid catalysis. Why does it have to be acid catalysis? If you don't have acid catalysis, you can't make this good leaving group and kick it out. Okay, so you have to have acid catalysis. You have to force the equilibrium to the product by adding a huge amount of excess reagent. And there's basically two reactions in one here. If you're trying to make the acetal, you would use an excess of the alcohol. But what if you don't want to make the acetal? What if you want to get back to what you started from? That's called hydrolysis. So to hydrolyze the acetal, you'd use excess water. And just to go back to the mechanism again, you can see how that all plays a role here. I am losing water when I make the acetal. And I'll just go ahead and cross that out just to keep it keep the lingo straight. So to make the acetal I have to kick out water. If I'm going to force the reaction back the other way I need to push that water back on so I'm going to use an excess of water. So we're going to show that mechanism just to reinforce this in this reaction, and you may look at this and say, whoa, where's the acetal? I'm confused. And again, I'm trying to give you a more complicated example um, as per, as was requested to give you some more difficult examples. So here is a, what may be a little bit more difficult um, example. So where is the acetal? Okay, remember to look at and think about oxidation state. Here is a carbon that is at, these are both CH3's, so 0, 0, minus 1, minus 1. This is at the plus 2 oxidation state. Oh, hey, that's the same oxidation state as that carbonyl. And in fact, there it is. This is an acetal between acetone and this complicated diol. Woohoo! So let's look at the mechanism for the hydrolysis of this funky acetal to give this alcohol and this ketone. Note again that it's acid catalyzed and there's an excess of water. This indicates that water is my solvent so there's definitely an excess. All right, so here we go. What's going to be the first step? Well, in this case, our first step is not going to be protonation of the carbonyl, but protonation of, I'm going to abbreviate my tosic acid like so, protonation of one of the oxygens in my my ketal here. Okay, so that's going to give me this guy. And I'm just going to abbreviate the rest of this as R. So now I've made a great leaving group. And if you'll just hold on just a second here. Okay, we're back online. I realize this is getting long, but I, in my experience, people just go bonkers over these mechanisms. So, you know, if you get it already, fast forward or something, So, or just ignore the rest of this so you're not bored out of your skull. But for those of you who are finding it a little difficult to keep this all straight in your head, stick with me. Okay, so I've protonated to make a good leaving group here. I'm under highly um, polar conditions, so... Hmm, what can happen next? Well, I'm going to show it like so. Hello, hello. This lone pair, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into the resonance contributor. This lone pair can go ahead and kick out that darn good leaving group. Just like that. Give it what for. Alright, if I do that, then I end up with... 
this guy who is still attached here got a positive charge all I've done is just kind of immediately jumped into this resonance contributor alrighty so see how these two are just resonance contributors oh, one for the other okay now what oh my god this is now what I need to make sure I'm writing the correct thing here uh, what could happen next what could happen next hmm well there's actually a whole bunch of things that could happen next but we do know that we have an excess of water so it pretty might pretty much makes good sense that the next step would be that this great electrophile is attacked by this great nucleophile to give you this intermediate remember to show things one step at a time okay now what hmm oh yeah whenever I see a protonated oxygen I'm gonna deprotonate it alright so I can deprotonate up here that makes sense so if I deprotonate here hmm well we'll just do that for right now then I've got H O C got our methyl groups here alrighty hmm am I getting any closer ultimately I'm trying to get to this dial and that ketone huh so that means well here's one of the alcohols I suspect this could be the other one especially if I then convert it into a good leaving group aha now we're cooking so if I pronate here then I've made this into a good leaving group and we've seen this before protic conditions super stable carbocation leaving group leaves to give me this carbocation plus aha there's my diol and this of course is just a resonance co contributor away from the carbonyl the protonated carbonyl so there you go I'm essentially right where I need to be I just need to deprotonate this and here's my other product so watch this as many times as you want to review this as many times as you want to think about what I'm doing here the biggest issue question problem is why does it protonate there why does it deprotonate there it protonates and deprotonates everywhere all the time it's just that eventually when it protonates here for example then voila in a heartbeat that leaving group leaves and the driving force for the hydrolysis is pushed 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 all the way 
all the way to the right by this terrible, terrible arrow by the excess of water. It's all equilibrium. Okay, we'll see these guys again. Uh, these acetals and key, um, acetals are f used quite frequently as protecting groups, and that will be a couple, three chapters from now. And they present really interesting alternatives to ways of putting together molecules, such as something called an acyl anion, which, believe me, is not something that you can make by deprotonation. So coming next, the nonsense of nitrogen nucleophiles, but yet another terrible joke. This one's a real groaner, ha, as if the last one wasn't. So an anteater walks into a bar, and he says he'd like a drink. Sure enough, says the bartender, how about a beer? No, replies the anteater. Well, then how about a gin and tonic, says the bartender. No, says the anteater. A martini? No. Well, by now, the bartender's getting pretty fed up, so he says, Hey, buddy, if you don't mind me asking, why the long nose? <laughs> really bad. I tell you, I warned you, you're going to be sorry you asked for more jokes. Okie dokie. Nitrogen up next. See you in class.